call the June 20th, 2016 regular school committee meeting to order at 7 o'clock. This meeting is both is being both video and audio taped by LCAT. Is anyone else recording in any manner? Okay. If not, we will rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll call starting to my left. Gregory Thompson. Here, Gregory Mayu. Rich Fischero. Bill Fonseca. Gordon Smith, Superintendent of Schools. Pamela Blair, Assistant Superintendent for Business. Kathy Salardi, Recording Secretary. And just as a note, uh, Beth is not with us tonight. Her and her family are taking a well-deserved vacation. Okay, item two. 2.1 approval of the June 6, 2016 regular session meeting minutes. Do I have a motion? I make a motion that we approve the June 6, 2016 regular session meeting minutes. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion on that? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Unanimous. Aye. Very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Committee and subcommittee com committee communications. Greg? We're all set tonight. Thank you. I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Rich? Just a uh, nice end of the year recognition ceremony uh, to Joyce Carlin and Jean Corus Corliss, who both made the Hall of Fame. Yeah, so that was a nice way to, a nice ending to the school year. Okay, um, last week I was in Washington, D.C. for the NSBA Equity Symposium and Advocacy uh, Conference. The Equity Symposium was sat held Saturday. It was a very well put together event. Just uh, the theme was, you know, you treat everybody equally, and it's, it's, this is gaining some momentum throughout the country. As a matter of fact, um, at an MASC board, meet, board of directors meeting last Wednesday, an MASC has been appro approached by Comcast and they're willing to sponsor an equity symposium in the eastern part of the state, possibly sometime early fall. So we'll keep everybody updated on that. Um, the advocacy part of the conference was Sunday and Monday, primarily focusing on the new Every Student Succeeds Act. And Tuesday, we, vis we visited the um, Massachusetts delegation, the congressional delegation at Capitol Hill. Very good conference. Uh, they did a good job, so well, looking forward to the next one. Okay. Thank you. Moving along to item four, opportunity for visitors to address the committee. Seeing none, we will move on to item five, presentations, superintendent's report 5.1.1. District-wide end-of-the-year presentation. Okay. We have our leadership team here this evening. We'll invite them up and uh, get ourselves set up on the screens. But in your packets and on your uh, iPads, you have our presentation of our annual progress based on our SMART goals. And uh, hopefully we'll give you some very good insight into what went on in all our schools this school year. slides in their packet or okay great so just taking a, just a quick look what this basically is attached to is not only our theory of action where we're looking to consistently strengthen our core instruction and keep that with an environment that's safe and nurturing um, and if we do that we feel and do that well we feel that we will be preparing our students to gain 21st century skills throughout their time from pre-k through grade 12 um, which gives them strong communication skills, the ability to work collaboratively, think critically, and problem solve. The way we set it up at the mid-year was we put a uh, couple of the first two goals because they're linked so closely together, the two district SMART goals, and so you'll see that um, both goals mentioned and then we'll go into the evidence. First SMART goal deals with making sure that we continue to look at our curriculum and be sure or ensure that uh, we have a standards base, we're providing standards based instruction that is aligned with the mass curriculum frameworks um, and that we are 
providing those opportunities for 21st century learning skill development. Goal number two has been one that um, has had a very consistent focus over the last two and this would be the third year where we're developing our common assessments to also align with our <coughs> curriculum frameworks but probably more importantly to develop a system of common assessments throughout the district that allows us to get formative, formative assessment information on our students quicker to help us inform our instructional plans throughout the school year. So we're just going to talk about a couple of um, overarching action steps that were taken and where we are with goals one and two. Uh, the schools are going to go into more detail around how they worked on these individually. Um, first of all, we continue to work on our curriculum and strengthen it, and the results are showing in STAR. Currently, 81% are above or at the benchmark in ELA, and 88.5% are at or above in math, as measured on STAR. It's important to remember that STAR is designed as a universal screener. Um, it's norm referenced, so the scores are in comparison to other students and not our own growth from one to the next unless you look at certain reports. These are based on percentile, percentile scores, so it is that norm referenced measure. Um, all schools have used their common assessments in the content areas to drive instructional decisions and they've had time to meet together and, and kind of look at that and we continue to refine our common assessments. You'll hear a little bit about that uh, from some of the buildings. And then we're really looking forward, uh, Gordon kind of uh, alluded to it, that this is going to become much more uh, easy for us to do once we are implementing Mastery Connect because we'll be able to have standards level data uh, item analysis level data that are in the teacher's hands immediately and, and for us that's really what the data is important for it, it really it's important to gauge where we are but the most important use of our data is in the hands of teachers who are then using it to inform instruction uh, this year we provided uh, the K-5 to curriculum with the curriculum change we provided professional development here you can see where uh, we had three professional development days that were devoted to supporting math uh, this year was the first year that our three to five uh, math coach was shared between the two buildings. She made uh, wonderful strides working with the teachers and building relationships this year. A uh, really good start to, to her um, collaboration with staff. And then department head meetings, K to five department heads meet monthly. And we dedicated that time to sharing instructional practices based on math. So every meeting that we had, we had a volunteer who shared um, and did kind of a model lesson for the rest of the group to see, hey, here's what a fluency exercise might look like in second grade, or here's, what, here's how, they're, um, how, we're gonna, how we're teaching fractions in fifth grade or third grade. So that was a way that we kind of uh, provided time for the department heads to, to practice, and then that filtered down into their grade level meetings as well. Just a, um, a connected point uh, with the budget that just recently passed, we'll be completing that uh, coaching model, so we'll have a math coach um, hired this summer, which will, who will work at uh, our youngest level. So that's been a model that uh, it has been working, and um, this should allow us to complete it, at least at pre-K through uh, eight. It's not, excuse me, you talked about uh, percentiles versus percentages. So the 81 and the 88.5 are percentages of those this who is the, hit the benchmark. Is the benchmark uh, uh, established based on a percentile? Is that what you were referring based on, to? Um, it's based on, well, that's, yeah, they're kind of intertwined. <coughs> There's a, your percentile ranked through all of the, the individuals in the districts who take the Right, but at some point assessment. the benchmark is... The benchmark is set by the system audit. based on, yeah, and we, we can have some opportunity to change that. We haven't done that, and, and I won't be able to tell you exactly why, but when we first set up STAR, they mentioned not changing our percentage in that ranking. Um, so it's right now it's 40% 40, 40 at or above is, is where they want you. 40% of students making it a particular score. Kind of and the reason that we haven't changed it, because we would up it, yeah. um, is that then we're no longer norm referenced. In other words, it's a norm referenced assessment. If we're not uh, being compared at the same percentage, then that change, uh, changes our percentile rank, if that makes sense. 
So it's, you have a certain percentage that you meet, and yep. then they compare everyone who's taken the assessment, and now your percentile ranked. Right. So yes. But, the, but the benchmark. The benchmark happens after the percentile. This is the percentage ranked. of students who are at or above the benchmark. When was the benchmark established? The benchmark is established by star. Not relative to the percentile. Correct. Okay. So we know where but the your, benchmark is. But going your to percentile is right. based on the percentage of those who are above the benchmark. Yes. At or above. Right. Yes. Okay, thank you. So here's a, just a little more information around what we're going to be doing with Mastery Connect, and that looks really small on the screen, so I'll just <laughs> talk real quickly for you. Uh, the system has been selected. That was done with a collaborative few, a few collaborative committees. We had over 40 staff members involved in some shape or form, uh, either evaluating systems, narrowing down what we were going to pilot, and then we had a number of staff across all schools who were piloting the systems, we asked them to evaluate again. Their recommendations came back to a committee who then made the final decision. Um, so we're pretty confident that Mastery Connect was the best overall system for us to, to select for, for our needs. And again, that'll give us standards level data beginning next year. We have a curriculum team who is in place right now and their job is to create um, kind of the, the initial instructional infrastructure for staff, so they are uploading or creating assessments in the system, as well as uh, creating what Mastery Connect calls a curricular map, which is simply a scope and sequence of standards when they're taught throughout a course that we can then tie to the, the, sta the standards on the assessments so that the data makes sense for individual teachers. Based on our own common assessments that, Correct. that we've developed in-house? Correct. So you have to match Correct. the timing up? Um, so what we want to make sure is that the standards are taught yeah. that are on that assessment. So that's basically what the map does, is make sure all those standards year, are addressed there. You've addressed all the standards. We go at it at the sequence that we decide mm -hmm. Correct. internally, but you have to set it up to track that. The, way we're, the, the reason why we're <clears throat> setting it up is to, one, kind of support teachers to spend less time doing the, the nuts and bolts of setting up their, their trackers. Uh, and more around learning how to use the system for the instructional planning and, and how do they access their data. So we're giving them a little bit of a head start with that. Another reason is that uh, we want to make sure that the standards that are on the assessments are in their trackers. And a tracker would look something like that, blue and green and yellow. Uh, if you can imagine that being that the blue are standards and then each row would indicate a student and how they are doing on each of those standards. So you're able to see classroom-based and then individual student-based, how am I doing on each of these standards? If I inadvertently set up a tracker and I delete some standards out of it, but then the district's assessment has those three standards I deleted, I won't be able to use that data because it's not gonna filter into my tracker at all. So we're, we've, we're doing the setup to make sure that they have all of the assessment information um, that they need. Can you um, settle a dispute I had with my 12-year-old over the common assessment and the, it's being used as part of students' grades? 12-year-olds are fun. <laughs> she's always right, too. Yeah. I have one of those at home, too. Student so. grades and common, the common assessments being used as part of students' grades. I'm not sure I know what the are, question are is. Are the results of the common assessments used in calculating grades for students? So we should be using all of our instructional data that we collect on a student over the year, both informal and formal, to determine grades. It's not one measure over another right. at those but grade But common levels. assessments are used. Um, yeah, I would uh, you'd have to see, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But, it, but my point, or my question to that is, because I thought it wasn't, because I thought our goal with the common assessment was so that we could pace our teachers on what they should be instructing, and so they are getting feedback on what they've instructed. In order to well, not over test yeah. those assessments in right. yeah. the place of other They do. Okay. Yeah. So there are times to like line up with the end of units and right. times where there wouldn't have been, would have been assessments anyways. Fair enough. Right. And but we don't, the, what we don't tell them that that your daughter how much is worth. Yeah. Well, and the, the purpose... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's not much. No. <laughs> the purpose of assessment... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I won't admit it. Well, I just did. Yeah, she was right. I thought that we didn't use common assessments. At the high school, the not all of our teachers um, use it as part of a graded assignment. And not all. Not but all. was qualified as a 12-year-old. Yes. But the purpose it, of the assessments across the board is so that we can make in sound instructional decisions for those students. Right. So it, they count, 
in that fashion, yeah. whether it's incorporated into the grade or not. I mean, at the three to five level, we specifically created next year's um, assessment, common assessment windows opposite uh, or not in alignment with our grading because we didn't want teachers to heavily rely just on the common assessment. We wanted it to drive instructional purposes. They have other formative assessments um, and, and information that they're gathering on a daily basis that, that can inform <coughs> the grading. Ms. Uh, what grade levels are we looking at for this uh, past week? Is it pre-K through 12? It is K, K through 12 K right through now. Pre-K is always a, <coughs> an 12. extra thing to think about. And, yeah. and, you know, this, this data we have here, it's, you can see the, the leadership team's creativity developing their own individual mm -hmm. um, report. A year from now, because of Master Connect, we would have a different report. We much more aligned school to school. You'll see, you'll see some different uh, images. No, that's what I'm asking. I'm asking, is it going to be much more aligned than it is now? It can, if yes, and then you may also see individual school data as well on okay, other measures that they want to show. No, I understand. Um, the I, work. I like but the creativity, as far as but it would help to, to kind of be able to look at one yes. type of template for all five schools. We can go from a very simple, um, and, and there's a small graphic there mm -hmm. where you see the 70% and then yep. there's the colors. Mm -hmm. We can do a linear um, look at the district on a whole for each content area mm -hmm. at what percentage of standards are, uh, are at mastery or near mastery okay. at that point in time. Um, so we can go, you know, pull it back and look broad that mm -hmm. way and you can drill down and look at individuals. Thank you, appreciate so it. So we will obviously have conversations about what we bring mm -hmm. um, and what you find most meaningful and what you want to look at for data as well. We'll so inform what you see. Who enters all the data? Uh, teachers and also the assessment, if it's a, it's basically how you, we, if you would grade your assessment on paper, you're now grading it in the system and okay. then it does the background work of now telling you where the student is on the standards you've assessed. Whereas right now, we have to do that work by hand. Um, and it's very time consuming. Uh, and we don't have a lot of time. So it's not being done um, right. to the, we'd rather have level. teachers mm -hmm. spend their time collaborating around instructional decisions yeah. and not crunching the numbers, so to speak. So this well, crunch the numbers. Crunch them. So you can look at individual students and look at mm -hmm. the class as a whole. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That's where they yep. yeah. That was probably the best, some of the best part of uh, the pilot was that some of the teachers who were working on it um, really got vested in it and started putting everything in because it just gave them such a level of clarity on where students were uh, and how they were addressing those, those needs. So. In addition to the common assessments, teachers can use this for their own formative assessments throughout the school year. So they can start to have that kind of in-depth knowledge on assessments they've been using before if they want to put them into the system. Does anyone outside of the district have access to the data? Not ours. We can um, lock it down. There is like a, um, a community, if you will, so you can share resources with other people who have Mastery Connect access as well. As far as our district assessments, those are locked in-house. They're just accessed by the district. And then to go one further, um, they're, not, they're not really assessed. Once they're in Mastery Connect, we have a window where we then make it accessible to the teachers. So they don't have it. Um, they, they develop the assessments, they have it. But as far as um, when we administer it, it's in a set window of time. Do we report to the state from Mastery Connect? No. <coughs> so the data this is itself just for us. is stays with contained, yeah. Absolutely. With us or is it with them? It's web-based with Mastery web Connect, but they have backup servers and everything's, okay. yeah, they checked out. We did an infrastructure assessment as well, so not just instructional purposes, but how the data is maintained. We had Brian Quimby in on the committee with us and okay. asked some security questions. If, if the student impact rating stays with us, this would be one of multiple avenues a teacher could use to bring that discussion to an evaluator. They could use the common assessments in Mastery Connect. You could use, uh, you have to use state assessments if that data is available for a teacher. Um, we've also allowed people to use STAR. So this, it would be one of a few avenues a teacher can utilize to bring that information. But in terms of sharing how our individual students are, we don't share that with, right with the department. Okay. So this is another data point, uh, the one that you're most familiar with because it's what we've had the longest. 
Uh, and so this is how we've done um, an aggregate, grades two through eight in STAR math and in ELA. From the fall is the red bar to the spring, which is the blue bar. Uh, in math, it went from 87 to 88.5% at or above the benchmark. And then in um, ELA, it was 74% to 81% at or above the benchmark. You'll start to see that broken down by schools, but that's the, the aggregate for all students, grades two through eight. Okay. Now we'll start hearing from the schools. Okay. Meadow Brooks first up. So um, I just want to start off by saying that the teachers at Meadowbrook have worked so incredibly hard at improving um, the core instruction at our building, and this is just evidence of it. So what you see here is the second grade spring reading and math star data, and this is a percentage of students that have met proficiency and above and advanced. So you could see in 213 where we were in reading was at 71% at the end of you know second grade, 71% of students were at or above, and this year we're at 89. Um, same for math. It's just so exciting. Last year we were at 80, we're at 89% proficiency. Um, so we are really, really excited um, about the, the growth that we're seeing. And I think that um, a big part of it is just, it's been the systematic focus that we've had on balanced literacy with reading workshop, with writing workshop. This year um, we did focus on language word study. And then math, I know Val spoke um, to it as well. We have a new math program, so we did provide full day um, professional development, our half days as well. We use a lot of that time to collaborate, and we also got a consultant from BU to come in and, and work with the teachers half day as well. So they have just worked so very hard, and, and these are the results. So. So this takes and breaks that data down a little bit further and um, star reading and star math. One of the interesting things that kind of stuck out to me is where we began the year this year for reading was at 76% proficient and math was at 71% proficient, which is where we were ending the year four years ago. So that just kind of speaks volumes in and of itself. From that 76% proficient or advanced in reading, we brought that up to 89%, which is a growth of 13% over the course of the school year. And for math, we brought it from 71% to 89% proficient by the end of the school year. And we were, while bringing those up, decreasing the number of students that we had on watch intervention and urgent intervention. We saw in reading a 3% decrease in the number of students that were on watch a 10% decrease in the number of students that were on um, intervention and kind of our urgent intervention category for reading maintained throughout the course of the year at 3%. For math, we saw um, an 11% decrease in our number of students on watch, a six percentage point decrease in the number of students in intervention and a one percentage point decrease in urgent intervention. Okay. Um, so we wanted to provide a little bit of information on our um, RTI, our intervention program. So I'm going to speak a little bit about the reading intervention, and Renee is going to speak to the math intervention. It says a total of 94 students, but if we add everyone together with students also um, receiving Lexia support and reading and also math, it's actually 108 students that received um, intensive uh, targeted instruction this year through our intervention program. Um, and it's a double dose, so in addition to what the students are receiving in guided reading in the classroom and that real um, targeted instruction, they also get, um, for first and second graders, they do get um, five times per week with 30 minute sessions. So it's very intensive and it's very targeted. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'll just go through grade one just to kind of give you an idea, but you can look at all of the different grades. And we put grade one first because those were the most students that we supported. Um, and it just seems to be a little bit of a trend. So there were 51 students that were supported. So that's 29% of our first grade class. 100% um, showed growth. Um, and 
we had uh, 46 of 51 of our students in grade one made significant growth. You could see grade two as well. We actually had 15% of the second grade class, which is kind of where you want it with intervention. It's usually 85, you know, 15%. So we got it there by the time we went to second grade. And then kindergarten, we don't start right at the beginning of the year because they're learning the routines and the procedures. So we usually start to pick them up um, in February. One of our big focuses this year was really to bring about some targeted intervention for math in the same, that we, same way that we were doing for reading. And we began the search for some really strong math programs in the start of the school year this year. There's not as much out there as there tends to be for reading that's of the same quality. So it took us a little bit of time to find something that we really felt comfortable investing in and what we ended up with purchasing in probably November was Do the Math by Marilyn Burns, which is a kind of table time program where they're meeting in small groups with the teacher. And then to support that was the Building Blocks, Building Blocks program by McGraw-Hill, which is a computer-based intervention program that um, we kind of run in conjunction with that table time with the teacher. By the time these were ordered and arrived and we got the intervention teachers comfortable with them, we started picking up students in April. We started with a pretty small group of first grade students and a few second grade students to try to pilot this this year and really see how it was going and whether it was gonna be a successful model for us. We did, based on this data, see pretty good amounts of success with this program with 64% of our first grade students showing growth and 100% of our second grade students showing growth in that short period of time between April and June. So our hope heading into the following school year is to really expand that program to include all grades and use it a little bit more um, in depth. Um, question, this, this, this slide here, do you see that changing with the new Meadowbrook Math Coach in any way? Um, the slide we're on right now, I'm sorry, right, I can't see that it. far, Rich. Oh. I don't have my glasses oh, yeah. Yeah. Slide, slide you're on. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's where I have my laptop in front of me, too. Um, do we see that changing? No, I mean, um, as far as, it, it, I mean, the, the ELA was, was so much more in depth. I just know if it's because you have a coach here and you don't have a coach here, that's why I'm asking. It, a big part of why ELA is a lot more in depth is that program has been established for a lot longer and um, we have a lot more supports available with our literacy coach as well as our three reading support teachers and their, their three um, paraprofessionals. Our math program really this year we just started picking that up so our hope would definitely be to increase that. A lot more students involved in that program as well as with the support of that math coach. Uh, okay. Looking at a lot of different angles that that math coach can be providing professional development for the teachers in the same way our literacy coach does and then picking up um, working with our intervention teachers as well. Okay, uh, Mountain View, I have all the data on one slide, um, trying to be consistent. Uh, <laughs> BAS. We did try to give a ceiling of how many slides people use. <laughs> uh, the BAS data I'm going to start with, which is the benchmark assessment system, a test administered to the students one-to-one -one by their teacher. So 100% of the students at Mountain View showed growth on this test this year. Approximately 70% of the students are at or above grade level benchmark. And it's important to note that within the last year, the expectations were raised by Fountas and Pinnell. So it's not as much growth as we've seen in the past, but it's still significant considering that they raised the grade level expectations uh, within the year. On star reading, 84% of our students total are at or above grade, uh, the grade level benchmark. In the fall, we ranged from 66% in third grade to 76% in fifth grade. So um, we saw significant growth from the fall to the spring. On STAR Math, 89% of the students are at or above grade level benchmark. That is a little bit stagnant from the fall. Uh, we were at that already, it, or close to it, at every grade level in the fall. So it was pretty level. For but intervention, it's, high, school, sorry. it's high, I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to go up, that? right, yeah. exactly. And 90% was my goal, so um, I was close. Uh, as far as interventions, a couple of years ago I started um, math interventions, which was something new. And reading interventions are done by our um, 
reading our I'm totally blanking reading specialist. our reading specialist thank you um, so 25 students received reading interventions from the reading specialist this year they use uh, she uses the LLI kit which is part of Fountas and Pinnell she works with three students at a time according to their reading level 24 of the 25 showed growth uh, 15 out of those 24 made significant growth in their reading levels from the beginning of the year. Three through five. Right Three through five. five. In math, I have a paraprofessional who um, inter provides the interventions face to face. It's not a computer program either. Um, she had 30 students total twice a week. 29 of those students showed growth, and 23 of the 29 showed significant growth enough so that at least uh, five or six of the students uh, didn't need the intervention anymore and were taken out of the program. And most of the student, the 15 and the 23, as long as they're third and fourth graders, won't need to go back in the fall. The fifth grade, um, of course, are moving on, so. But they're still monitored? They're still monitored because of the STAR. Yes, we use the STAR. We decide on who those students are based on the bass and the star in the fall but then they're monitored throughout the year to see when they can yeah. be moved out do we use bass specifically because it's a Fontes and pinnell <coughs> assessment and then because we use Fontes and pinnell as part of our intervention yes that's yes why we it's similar it's the no that's not why we chose bass that's why we chose the lli yeah. intervention oh. mm -hmm. yeah so we're paying for both of those Fontes and pinnell depending on how to teach the students and then the assessment itself. Well, we're not the assessment. The assessment we, we already have. We it's oh, part of the program. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a corner of the market. Yeah. It's yeah. The other Interesting. There's not a lot of, um, it's like a one-time cost, basically. Yeah. Because we have uh, our own our own sheets yeah. and things like that. The kit is the kit. Yeah. My, um, my thought is more on the assessment and the tool we use for the intervention during the the teaching is from the same place. Right, and the reason uh, that a lot of the schools it, it have gone to using the LLI is because of the, the research behind it. Mm -hmm. It's really uh, mm -hmm. shown to be uh, when, <laughs> now I'm losing my words. <laughs> so when it's implemented with fidelity, meaning the way they've designed it, and you have a highly qualified teacher doing it who's, you know, we have reading specialists who mm -hmm. are trained um, some of them are reading recovery trained, so they, they're, they're highly knowledgeable. When they use those materials um, and they're implementing them the way they're designed, they have white papers and research out there that shows a significant increase above other, um, other intervention programs. Uh, it's particularly uh, newer research has come out around its effectiveness with English wow. language learners, um, and they're seeing significant improvement. So we're using it with those, with those students as well. Um, and you can see by by your, some of your reading data, that it is it is meaningful. We're not going to continue to use something if we're not getting good yeah. results out of it. Yeah. Right. So here's what I got created for you, Mr. Fichero. <laughs> <laughs> this is just for you, actually. I was putting this together. I said, Rich is really going to like this. <laughs> so um, just looking horizontally, um, one thing that you know, I like about STARS, there's multiple know, ways okay. that you can look at the data. And when we look at at or above a benchmark, when we look at percentile rankings, and we look at student growth percentile, all of those um, are areas where we have the vocabulary and can have conversations around the student data when it comes to STAR. Um, so in the fall, in our reading data, we started at 59th percentile, all of our students. Um, and then in the spring in ELA uh, or reading, we were at the 68th percentile. Um, in the fall, we were 72% at or above the benchmark. In the spring, we were 84 at or above the benchmark. Um, and then our student growth percentile was 64 in ELA, which is excellent. Um, moderate growth is where we're looking to meet, which is at 40 to 60. So anything above that is high growth. So we're really excited about that. And then it has our changes. So if you look at the changes in percentile ranking, we we're at plus nine percent. When we look at at or above, twelve percent of our students um, uh, changed over time there. So that was reading, and then math. Uh, the students um, surprisingly or do better in in the star math than they do in ELA. And this kind of goes back while reading. This goes back 
um, year after year, the trends are, are similar. So in the fall, they came at the 65th percentile, and then in the spring, they're at the 77th. The um, change was uh, plus 12 for percentile ranking. Um, the at or above benchmark was at 84% already coming in, and then in the spring, we're at 91%. That was pretty exciting data to be 91% at or above the benchmark for math. Um, and our SGP was 58, so it's just, just below that high growth target. Um, and that was plus seven um, for a change. For our reading intervention, um, we, we had 32 students that received intensive reading instruction. And they came in at the 30th percentile ranking on average, and then they ended at the 43rd percentile, which was a change of plus 13. And then math was, was excellent. We started at 38%, 38 students that um, required uh, an additional math instruction during our intervention time. We had the, we're at the 26th percentile ranking, and those students ended up at the 47th percentile, and there was a change of plus 21%. So we were really excited about that data. Um, and, and math in general, hitting 91% at or above um, the benchmark, the star, and then having an intervention change of 21% for a percentile ranking was was actual excellent. And that was just remarkable work that we analyzed the exit tickets from the um, Eureka assessment. We provided intervention in those areas for reteaching moments for students that didn't quite master that particular lesson. We also used Do the Math, which is something that Meadowbrook uses as well. and. Um, to answer your question, Rich, with the math coach, we're currently investigating a couple more um, evidence-based interventions to implement going into next year with our math coach. And not having the math coach, you know, I wouldn't have the uh, the resource that uh, that she brings to really build this um, program and intervention program and the professional development around math in general. Um, so that was all very exciting and very <coughs> exciting to report. Um, thank you for. Um, one question, um, Meadowbrook and Martin will give us a quick snapshot of what their intervention program looks like. Could you do the same, Mr. Fred, just a quick snapshot of sure. what it looks like? Sure. Mm -hmm. So um, all the grade levels have a common intervention time. They're um, three 30-minute blocks per week. So at that intervention time, we really use our data team meetings at the beginning of the year and then make adjustments at the middle of the year for exactly what students are receiving during that time who the professionals are responsible to be instructing them during that time, and then the app, and then the programming that they are using during that time. So once we have that data team meeting, we analyze all the data, we discuss the learners, we place them into the intervention that, that's necessary for those three 30-minute periods per week. We've been doing this now for, uh, this is our third year doing this. Um, and we've had we've had really great results, and this year was our best. So it's getting better and better. Do you have students at or above um, benchmark that require intervention? You must. At or above the benchmark that require because the percentile is based on the amount of students who meet at or at or above the benchmark. Correct. The percentile ranking is different than the students that are at or above the benchmark. The benchmark is a, is a target. It's, it's actually at or above the target. It's a target that STAR sets. Mm -hmm. And the students that meet that target are the percentage of students in Maple Shade that actually meet that target or exceed that specific score. The percentile ranking are how our students on average rank according to the hundreds of thousands of students that take STAR. Um, that's the difference between percentile ranking and okay. target. So those that are receiving intervention all fall within the 30th, 30th percentile? On average. On average. On average. <coughs> they're on the, so they're on, so that's like, where they fall. They're on like the low end of the percentile ranking. So when you rank all your students, yeah. you have this chunk of students down here mm -hmm. okay. that require the intervention. When we have the data team meetings, that gives us the, an indicator <coughs> of um, the decisions we're going to make to help those students out. Can I just add that, so when we take a look at the STAR data, um, usually what it does is it benchmarks kids. So if it's our kids that fall below 40% um, are on watch, below 20 25% are intervention, below 10% are urgent intervention. So. Percentile. Percentile. Sorry, percentile. Yeah. So it kind of 
gives us an idea, based you know, where to, where to target, right? Based on those okay. national norms. And some of those are on watch, you know, but then when they get to a certain level, then. So we must lose students out of intervention based on our change of percentile? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's the goal. Inevitably, right. Right. Okay. Just to move them out. Okay. Uh, Mr. Smith and Ms. Cindy, just a, just a, a presentation clarification. So sure. we're moving now to district goal number two. So if I'm correct, K, this is a K through five presentation on district goal one and two, and then we're going to hit six through 12 for goal one and goal two. Mm -hmm. Correct. That's the way it's organized? Okay. Yes. Okay. So um, we were just asked to talk a little bit about the common assessments. Um, so in our K uh, grade level, um, they administer the BAS two times a year, so they usually do it in the winter um, and in the spring. Uh, but first and second grade, the BAS is administered three times a year. Uh, for writing, our ELA, our writing common assessment, um, there's three initial assessments that are administered in September, and it's the narrative, the opinion, and the informational. So it's almost kind of like a pretest type thing. And then they're given a writing post-test that's administered at the end of each unit, at the end of the narrative unit, at the end of the opinion unit, and at the end of the informational unit. And um, the teachers and literacy coach have created a standards-based instructional rubric that they use with that. Um, for our math, K-2, to it's three times a year. And I just wanted to thank Valerie, or um, Anir. She actually came and dedicated full days to work with our math curriculum writers in um, revising and creating the new math assessments. So she met, you know, with kindergarten, with first grade, with second grade, and she stayed all day and, and worked. Um, so they, that's completed. And it's actually, um, it's been created already in the Mastery Connect system. Um, and additionally, our K-2 teachers, we participate in half-day data analysis and instructional planning meetings in, um, in the fall and in the winter. Common assessment work that we've been doing for the last few years now is starting to get into Mastery Connect. Mm -hmm. um, and if we can get all of that set up so our teachers are ready to go as of August 29th, we'll be in a much better position to use that data throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So this slide is uh, Mountain View and Maple Shade yeah. together. Yeah. And we're only focusing on, I should have clarified it in the title, the district developed common assessments. The BASS and the STAR we already talked about, they're common also, but these are the assessments that we've developed. So this year we used, we gave one ELA assessment and two math assessments. And the reason we only did one ELA was the park window, although we only had one this year, it was extremely long. Um, at our level, we have to provide a lot of accommodations for students, whether it's small group, individual. We had at Mountain View three kids break their arm right before the test, so they needed scribes. Um, so the window was about five and a half weeks long. We did not want to give the students another test after the park. Um, they were going to have to take the star anyway, but that's an easier test for them. It's computer based. It's not as extensive. So we, that's why we only gave one this year, just to explain the reason for the difference. Um, we use these tests formatively, as we've already talked about. This was more about what do we need to teach? What, are the, what do the students need as far as instruction? It wasn't about grading them necessarily, um, but teachers can use them for grades. They're just not weighted as, you know, maybe the same as other tests that are much, cover more material. We talked about revisions for next year at our grade level curriculum meetings. And uh, Michael's gonna talk about the next slide, but it shows how our teachers stored the data this year because we didn't have a Mastery Connect system. So, Michael, and Before you um, move into the data sheets, just a lot of the feedback that um, Ms. Sentinel is talking about in terms of the park windows, that's getting good discussion on the state level. Yeah. Uh, because the, the windows for park um, are extremely long and it's something that uh, both, actually a few associations are involved in, the Mass Association for School Superintendents, the um, Administrators Association across the state are discussing this. 
Because the goal of formative assessment is not necessarily to continuously assess your students, is to strategically place assessments where you can use it and gain the data quickly enough to actually inform instruction. Um, and so we're, we're keeping that balance in mind, both locally, but also keeping the discussion going at the state level. Um, and I know that MASC is lobbying yeah. the legislature around that as well. There is some, there is some, there is starting to show some movement on it too. That'll help us out going forward. Well, we're going to continue to make local decisions that are going to be in the best interest of our students. Yeah. So one quick question then. So you two are giving the same common assessments at two yes. different schools. So mm -hmm. yes. fourth grade, whatever, That's you right. know. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. That's right. So all those teachers have had collaboration time together between the two schools. That's right. And more so this year for next year's assessments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's where the coach also becomes yeah. so important. Right. That coach is helped a lot. Getting similar support Both coaches helped a lot. As yeah. well right. as strategic planning for the administrators with the coach mm -hmm. so that we're seeing it in, in both schools. So the numbers on this, do you mind, Gordon? Yeah, no. The, the, num the numbers on this are important. I, I just put this up <laughs> almost as sort of like a, a selling point as to why we need a data mm -hmm. warehousing portal in our district. So. This is just an example of one teacher's classroom roster and how the data for the common assessment, STAR, benchmark assessment, math assessment, ELA assessment, is all stored. And then they go to the data team and they analyze these spreadsheets and really try to find instructional gaps in learning or celebrations in learning as well. Um, but it does get cumbersome to look through all of this data as a teacher and then try to make the best instructional decisions for students. And then the assessment behind it as well is there. So when you want to really <coughs> drill down to a particular student and how they were assessed and what standards were met or not met on that assessment, it's very challenging to do a great job with data team and when you look at data in this way. But they are warehousing this. They are meeting about this. We are, all of us collectively, are making um, the best <coughs> intervention decisions possible. Um, the, the good news of this is this then gets shared forward. So I take all of this data and we share it with next year's teacher. So that teacher right in the beginning of the year <coughs> knows where the students are at and it also helps between schools. So Meadowbrook mm -hmm. shares their data with us. We share our data with Birchland. Um, so that has been helpful for, you know, for, for this system. But, um, this is our district common assessment analysis sheet as it stands right now. So I just wanted to show you a model of it. So each row represents a student. Yes. Mm -hmm. And right. it's much longer yeah, the than students that. Are <laughs> sure. yeah. part, of it. part of it. The students are cut <laughs> off the board. Right. And I even think I cut a fall bass off of there on accident. But it's right. just really to show you a model of what we're working with. And the teachers have to hand enter all this into a Google sheet. So after they're grading, they're still entering it all into the. Well, if we can build the assessments in to Mastery Connect. Right. No. Right. right. Machines, right. machines doing the work. Right. Yeah. Okay. So just very briefly, kind of the big key points of how did we how did we get there? Um, with the new math curriculum, we've had a very heavily standards-based math instructional focus for all of our professional development at Meadowbrook this year. Um, we brought it as a thread throughout everything we did, right through our grade level times and team time and all of that. Um, we have done, uh, watched videotapes of our colleagues. We've even watched a videotape of Lisa going in and doing some math lessons in the classroom and then debriefed around those videos. We've had a full day workshop with the Eureka representative as well as a representative from Looney Math Consulting once we got a little further in the year to see how can we now take this wonderful resource that we have and start to begin um, differentiating for our students. She did a lesson study model where she came in and pre-conference with teachers during their grade level time before school. She went in and modeled lessons and then debriefed with our whole group and then really got into how can we now take this model and begin getting deeper with our kids. Uh, we moved, because of that shift towards math and our whole school professional development, our ELA professional development became a little bit more embedded and that's where having uh, coaches is such an amazing thing. We were able to 
really focus our lesson study, our work with all of our grade levels, K to two this year, around fully implementing our Words Their Way Word Study program. Last year was a pilot year where some of the teachers did that. This year was full implementation. We also revised and aligned math and ELA common assessments, as Lisa already discussed. And for grades K to two, we met at least twice this year to analyze student work and begin planning. And part of that, in addition to just looking at data and planning next steps and in instruction within our classroom and across the grade level, is we embed professional development within those days as well, where we will um, videotape one of our kids and one of our teachers doing one of the BAST assessments. We'll then watch it together, we'll analyze it together, we'll talk about it in order to try to calibrate because there is a little bit of a subject subjective piece to that that we're always trying to get a little bit tighter and a little bit tighter on each year. Uh, our action steps were, um, I had two learning walks and I used the praise and polish focus, which I learned at a workshop earlier in the year from Kim Marshall, who uh, writes a lot of books on teacher observation. So basically, as we walked through the room, the, the people that were on the walk focused on what was something they could praise and what is something that could be polished in the room as we walked through. And I shared all of the feedback with the whole staff, obviously with that names attached. Um, we have professional development focused on Eureka Math, Empowering Writers, uh, which is a writing program, and student behavior. Our technology continued to be integrated in our PTO. I'd like to thank, uh, just bought us another Chromebook cart and 25 Chromebooks, as well as five more iPads. Um, they had been kind of saving money um, in anticipation of building a playground in about 10 years. It would have taken that long to accumulate the money. <coughs> um, so they had money that they wanted to spend, so they bought us what we asked for. So we will not have as many fights in the hallways over the carts. Uh, our staff meetings and uh, were used for professional development and collaboration and data teams. Um, mindfulness with Gina Rodas and common assessments were analyzed and revised during the data team as well as talking about student um, progress at the time. <coughs> um, Maple Shade, we also had learning walks. We, we focused on student collaboration in the classroom and reflection, um, teacher checks for understanding and instructional strategies and the learning time structure. So. Basically, when teachers went into the classroom, there were questions to answer with all of these categories is how were the students collaborating and reflecting on their learning? How did the teacher check for understanding? What instructional strategies were used? And how was the learning time structured? They answered all those questions in the debrief and then shared them out with the staff. And we sort of pulled some kind of golden nuggets from that collectively as a school um, to improve um, our professional development as well, focused on Eureka Math. We um, tried to provide options to deepen teachers' content knowledge and to differentiate, and to differentiate options for professional needs. So we had um, a math, we had an ELA, we had a special education, we had a science um, opportunity when we could provide it. Um, we as well are improving our technology integration all the time, I think having more um, Chromebooks added to our school next year is going to be um, very welcome. Um, we're looking forward to that. Um, we, we do our common assessment analysis according to that um, Google data sheet that I showed you previously. And we, we're really trying to focus more and more on innovative ideas and innovation in the classroom and innovative pro programs and projects all the time. We had a GEMS club after school, which is girls excelling in math and science. Um, we have robotics for all of our students. We have um, opportunities for project-based learning. Um, we have a tech club that meets midday. Um, we try to focus a lot of our lessons on STEM integration into many, many things. Um, Genius Hour is something that was new that sort of cropped up this year in third grade. We have our invention convention. Our GT Pushin program does engineering design model. Um, and, you know, any more and more things that come up or more and more things we want to you know, try to strive uh, toward doing in this area. So um, those, that's something that I'm very proud of for Maple Shade. TV studio? We that's have a TV studio. Club. That's, that's our tech, tech club. club. Yeah. yeah. We have yeah. a TV yeah. with a green screen. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. He's doing a lot of work with Don Mackey. It's great. It's excellent. A lot of the things you see in, in all three uh, key action steps, you see in, an incredible amount of collaboration. Just mm -hmm. to touch on, the learning walks have come so far. Uh, in my first year as superintendent, to provide that type of feedback, you would have uh, had a good deal of resistance. Not even provide the feedback, but um, entering into classrooms in groups of three, four, and so forth. But the culture across the district certainly has changed where people are seeing that as a plus and that they're getting good information back from their colleagues. And the, as we get better as uh, instructors at collaborating with each other, I think then we are better at providing lessons that allow our students to collaborate. Okay, so now we'll look at into some Birchland Park data. Um, what you're looking at here is star reading growth. Um, we look a lot at growth percentages, uh, although we do have the overall percentages on the third slide. Um, so this is just two columns. If you're looking at the chart, it's the median student growth percentage um, of all of our students and then of our tiered students. As you know, we focus a lot on our tiered programs. Um, so the median student growth for the year, you can see on the left column there, 47, 56, 58. Uh, we certainly like to be up in the upper 50s, but anywhere from 40 to 60 is considered good. Uh, so that's all in that ballpark. And then especially in 7th and 8th, um, we're very proud um, of the tiered st students' um, star reading um, growth because a lot of those students are dealing with, by the time they get to the middle school, you see what they've already been through um, intervention-wise. So if they're still in, if they're in our tiered reading program, a lot of them can be dealing with some real challenges. Um, so to still have growth percentages of 41, 63, and 55, uh, we're very happy with. And then you can see in seventh grade, it's more, it's actually a faster rate of growth than all students and in eighth grade, it's close. So the next slide um, talks a little bit about Fontes and Pinnell. We also do um, benchmark testing using Fontes and Pinnell um, in our reading, uh, tiered reading classes only. So we don't do this with the whole school, we just do it with our tiered students. Uh, the reason we do Fontes and Pinnell is that um, all of my tiered reading team would just agree it gives much, much clearer formative data and gets you way closer in touch with exactly what's going on versus just the STAR assessment. Um, when, and, and the STAR assessment is very formative, but Fontes and Pinnell takes it even further. Um, so they did raise their expectations, Fontes and Pinnell, this year, but even with those expectations raised, 30% of our tiered students by the end of the year uh, we're at grade level or one, 30% um, were at grade level and 24% were just one year below grade level. So of all our tiered students, 54% of them were at grade level or one year below by year's end. So that means, if you look at the very bottom, a lot of our tiered students gained more than a year's growth within one year. So we're also very proud of that. Um, our tiered program has become so specialized that there's like multiple intervention programs taking place in the same class at the same time, from Lexia to a new program we implemented called Vi Visualizing and Verbalizing, which is really reaching some of our lowest readers and, and really showing us growth in, in those students. So I'd be lying if I said I understood everything that was going on in that room, but I understand that the professionals do and they're doing a lot of really good stuff and the data is showing it. Um, the next slide is math growth on STAR. Um, and again, you want to be in the 40 to 60. You can see our, if you look down the all students, 49, 52, 49, so right where we should be. And then our tiered students in math are growing at a faster rate um, than, our, um, non, than our general population. So again, the tiered um, students, the math student growth is, is, is extremely high at 56, 61, and 57. I forgot to say this on the other slide, but uh, we had 19 students this year get out of tiered reading during the year because of the work they were doing and the progress they made. We had 50 students get out of tiered math during the year. Now, some of these students will end up back in tiered math because they'll fall behind again. And we look, uh, it's, one of, it's three times a year, it's one of the more um, sort of larger processes we go through each in the middle of each year. It takes three or four days to go through all the data and decide who's coming out, who's going in. But to have 50 students get out of tiered math during the year, um, I think that's also just a testament to the fact the way, to the way we built the system. Young adolescents need authentic carrots, like 
to truly engage. And so by making it so they can get out, we're seeing a lot more hard work out of students who I think if they couldn't get out, would just kind of coast. Um, so it's working. And then the next one is the more is the more general slide that we've all had, which is just, one? yeah. I, I haven't gone through this. Shouldn't the tiered math slide be next? That's what I, just, you, I, mean, I, I just did tiered math. This no, one's tiered math. You, if, after you went over the, uh, the, the star of reading, the reading, you went over all the different tiered students. Is, is that, I mean, I noticed Alex is coming up after this, correct? So we did star reading yeah. growth. Then there was a slide and on. We did Pontus and Pinnell, okay. like Bass, just to right. just to follow okay. up reading. Then we did star math growth. Okay. And now before we leave, um, before we leave star. So yeah, maybe. But so before we leave star, this is just overall star. That in sixth grade, seventy-eight percent of our kids were at or above benchmark uh, in reading. In seventh grade, seventy-five. And in eighth grade, seventy-seven. Then you can look at the bottom, and that's the math. 87% in sixth grade out or above, 89% in seventh, and 86% in eighth. So very similar to the other schools' data in that math seems to outscore reading and star. Um, yeah. you know, who knows what that means, because usually yeah. on park, <laughs> the ELA outscores math. Um, yeah. But numbers in the ballpark with the elementaries. So we're a little behind them in our percentages in the, yeah, in the reading, um, but we're right with them in our percentages in the math. So then the next slide is just a look at Alex. I think you all know at this point that we use Alex as our RTI program in our math class, uh, or as our main one. Uh, Alex is run through Scholastic. So this is a hard one to really present um, clear data on. It's, it's even a hard one for them to explain to me the data on. But this is the best I could come up with, which is students, when they, when they first enter into the world of Alex, they take an assessment. And the assessment tells you which grade level they should start learning at. Um, so not just testing at, Alex tests you and teaches you at the same time. So um, if you look at sixth grade, maybe we'll just do that one, but if you look at sixth grade, at the beginning of the year, 63% of students, when they pre-test in Alex, were designated to start at a grade level course that's two or more years below their grade level, okay? And then sixty three percent of your tiered of our tiered students. Yeah. So these are already yeah. identified. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Of our already tiered. identified students. Yeah. yeah. Of our tiered students. And so then the whole goal is how, how much do they grow while they're in tiered? And when they're in tiered, they're they're working and learning on web based Alex and they're working and learning independently with work from the teacher and they're working and learning in small groups and with targeted um, topics by the teacher. So you can see if we just look at six, 63% of them to start the year were two or, years two or more years below grade level, and by the end there was nobody that far behind. 28% were one year below grade level, and by the end there was nobody that far behind. And then 9% of our tier kids were working at grade level, and by the end 100% of them were working at grade level. Now, that does not mean they've mastered grade level. That just means they've gotten to the point where they've mastered according to Alex so below grade level and now they're working on a grade level course. Mm -hmm. Hope that makes sense. So then you can see for seventh and eighth the same kind of trends. Um, I don't I don't need to walk you through all but yeah. so we're seeing uh, so we would argue that Alex is still really working and kudos to the students because they really engage with it. They have a notebook with them while they're doing it. They have a paraprofessional that's uh, math certified that walks around and, and is over their shoulders helping them. And, um, you know, they're young adolescents. They don't always feel like doing it, but they do do it, and you can see the results because they engage with it. Dr. Young, once again, as they asked, um, everybody's building a snapshot of how this plays into the schedule. They're, they're, they're how much for reading and how much for math tiered instruction? Yeah, so in sixth grade, we try to catch kids. So if they're in tiered reading or tiered math, they have it every day. Okay. Um, in seventh and eighth, it is a three day a week class, much like Spanish, um, STEAM, a couple other classes. So thank you. Okay, so uh, unlike uh, grades K through eight, um, the high school does not use a very uh, standardized software assessments like the BAS and the STAR. A lot of the data that we generate has to be very specific, either to national standards, state standards. They're definitely more content and skill based and very specific to the many different types of not only co core classes that we teach, but also our elective courses. So it's a little bit difficult 
to, um, you can't really find a program mm -hmm. that, that fits neatly into the high school model. Um, so, that, so that being said, this year we really wanted to jump on the bandwagon of, co of collecting data and it was really challenging. We started off the year just trying to find something that would work and um, you know, we gave our teachers the flexibility to kind of do things that, that felt comfortable for them. We didn't want to have, have to teach a whole new system to everybody. So we had some teachers that were utilizing um, Google Documents. Some teachers were creating their own spreadsheets in Excel. Um, I did purchase um, a software uh, program called GradeCam, which allowed the teachers to have their kids you know, take a picture of their assessment to collect data. So in terms of a unified data reporting system, we were all over the place, which really made the task of collecting and an analyzing data very difficult. Um, so what I, what I have in front of you is I kind of picked the best of the bunch in terms of um, how one department kind of organized their data this year. So as you can see, this is a, a, what we call the data protocol sheet. And what we asked, what was common in this process is we asked every content area, so art, PE, and English, math, and science, we said, take a look at your common assessments. And you know, we've done a lot of work in developing our common assessments. And we said to them, the priority standards, the, the key really meat of your course, we'd like you to create an assessment that gives some feedback on that. So that was done, again, through every, every core content at the high school. And so as you can see here, this is just a sample. Um, so English picked a series of different um, common core standard um, standards that they utilized for their assessments. Again, we didn't do term one because we didn't have an assessment tool in place, but um, they, they did uh, give the assessment for term two and term three. So you can see that particularly, this is a 10th grade class, which obviously is our MCAS um, class. We did see some growth with our 10th graders in terms of some of those important standards. Um, and then we asked the teachers to identify the strengths and then urgent needs. Now these, these conversations took place at their department meetings and they were led by the department chairs. Um, we asked, so every content area did, did this. Um, so math did this, science did this across the board. The next step that um, we asked them to do is, okay, now that you've, you've seen the scores, you've seen the strengths, you've seen the urgent needs, now let's ask some key questions that'll help get our students back on track. So some of the things we asked our teachers to do is, um, you know, what are taking a look at the data. What are some questions that you have as instructors to move the instructional, the teaching, learning um, forward? What were some possible root causes for some of the things that you were seeing with your data? And then we had each team develop some learning goals moving forward um, in terms of teaching, but also learning that could be implemented in the classroom and then identify some strategies that collectively guys could, could employ. Um, in terms of our math um, department, one of the things I think that was really, um, I think a positive thing that come out of this year was um, Valerie actually came to the high school and as you know, we don't have the park as a mandated um, testing for the high school right now, but we wanted to kind of get ahead and start looking at the park assessments and some of the things that our students can be expected to do. And as we all know, it's extremely much more rigorous than what our kids are now um, getting with the typical MCAS question. And so what we asked the math department to do is we first asked them to take a look at the questions and um, kind of pick it apart like, you know, is, is this in line with some of the things that are going on in your classroom? And the conversation is really powerful. Uh, our math teachers, you know, across the board were like, this test is a lot harder than what our kids are probably used to. And so one of the things that we tried to get them to do, and it's a work in progress, it's something that we're gonna connect, um, continue next year, is we had them take a look at their common assessments and compare them to the park test. And we had them you know, rate how your test, in terms of rigor, rates to the park. And that was another aha moment. And so the conclusion of that work was that uh, moving into next year, we're going to start tweaking and modifying the common assessments that are delivered to, for um, the math department so that they model some of the things that the kids are going to be expected in the park, which equals a lot more rigor for our students. Um, so we're kind of doing that across the board. We also um, did that in English, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. The one thing I did want to point out is you hear a lot about interventions at the K through um, 8 level. And um, a couple years ago, we took a stab at creating a tiered instruction courses at the high school, as you know, because you approved those courses. We had one in math, we had one in English. 
Um, I can tell you that for both math and English, we probably identified a total of 12 to 15 students that were considered um, need for interventions at the high school level. And unfortunately, what happened was, I think for the high school student, it is a really hard pill to swallow to be placed in a course where they perceive there's a stigma. So we're in the tiered math course, and you know, there's a lot of you know, uncomfortable feelings about that. And as a result of that, um, we had a lot of kids, uh, parents sign them out of the class. So they dropped the class. Um, so we started off the year with like 10 kids, 15 kids, and uh, with a drop off, we were at running a class of three, three kids. So, uh, you know, at the high school with, with personnel and staffing, it's just not feasible to run courses that low. And we've talked to different high schools. As a matter of fact, when we had our program, we were getting calls from across the district or across the region, we want to see your program. And, you know, that was an indication to us that a lot of high schools are struggling with the idea of providing those type of interventions. But thankfully, because of the work these guys are doing, that the more interventions and the more we're catching students along the way, the hope is that when they get to high school, those numbers of kids needing um, help with remedial and foundational skills will be lower. So it'll help us as we kind of dive right into the content and skills for the different courses that we have. Um, so the next slide, um, as I said, well, we're trying to take a systematic approach um, of trying to improve our core content at the high school. I just mentioned the work that we're doing with mathematics. Um, the math department this year focused their professional learning communities on the mathematical practices, and I invited Gordon and some of the other, uh, Valerie, to come to our end of the year uh, PLC presentation, but we had a situation at the high school that present, prevented that from happening. <laughs> but if you had come, you would have seen videos that the math department um, did this year in which they uh, videotaped each other and um, created a video of the mathematical practices that were being utilized within their classroom. So they are definitely being reflective and trying to work on, on kind of aligning themselves to a more rigorous curriculum. The work that we did with 6 through 12 vertical alignment, I think, was really powerful. Um, one, what we did was um, we wanted to make sure that grades 6 through 12, that we were hitting all the standards appropriately. We wanted to make sure that there weren't gaps in learning 6 through 12. And so um, myself, Valerie, and Tim, and Connor, and we, we got together and we created this two-day workshop. And essentially what we asked all the teachers to do, so it was is 6 through 12 English teachers, which is really unique to get them all together. And they got along great, by the way. Um, what we had them do is we had them take a look at their curriculum. This is just a sampling right here. This is just a, a grade nine. So we had them do this for grades six through 12. And um, we took the, we picked apart the strands for ELA and we said, okay, what, what are your priority skills per grade level? What are the major products that you require your students to do? And what standards do you focus on? And so we did that. 6 through 12, we had a gallery walk where everybody went around and took notes. And then, the next slide, as you can see here, we kind of started charting out, you know, what standards are being covered 6 through 12 so that we could get into deeper conversations. Okay, well, how much um, is covered? Are there gaps? And as you can see here, um, one of the biggest gaps, at least from the high school perspective, that we discovered through this work was that we weren't doing enough informational text enough of diving into that. So that's that kind of has changed a lot of the um, work that our teachers are doing at the high school. So I think we, we really would like to do something very similar to this um, for math next year. It's a, just a matter of kind of coordinating and finding the time to get everybody together. But I think um, teachers would tell you that for them, it was, it was a unique experience to be able to sit down with their colleagues um, at the middle school and kind of flush out, you know, what are, what are the things that are going on at the secondary level with their, their content area. Um, so that's it for the high school. Oh, I will say one other thing. I know it sound like a broken record. We were, we're going to be very excited when Mastery Connect comes into place because we never had anywhere near what, I mean, at least they have some nuggets of similarity within their common assessment data. We've had nothing. So for our teachers, it's going to be very powerful. Um, Myself and Frank are representing the high school with the Mastery Connect um, data entry this summer. And one of the things um, we were so excited to see is that our teachers will be able to put their normal, like their everyday assessments in there as well. So it's not just the common assessments, but they can see how it gradually builds to those common assessments. And I think that's going to be a real eye opener for a lot of our teachers as well. Definitely, just one question. Yep. I, going back to the tiered instruction, um, help me with my memory. If, I know we do very well in MCAS, 
<clears throat> I think we're all in the high 90s, everybody passing. But those students that get needs improvement, do they still have to have kind of like a, and they're not special education, they still have yes, to have kind of a, a TA plan? There is a, a plan for them to. Um, it's IPP. 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 Oh, they so we have to create that. some kind of plan to help them reach their goals so, by the time that they so graduate. You, so it was essentially at the at that level there was a, there was a TA plan. It is, but it's not as comprehensive and right. standard based focus as as meaty as the assessments right. that they're doing in right. terms of like getting to those foundational skills. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that we're doing again this year is we're offering our very own um, summer school for math. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's really it's really it's really frustrating because we know we have a need for it, mm -hmm. but then we don't get kids signing up yeah. for. You know, I think the high school uh, the psyche of the high school student is is very different, and their priorities are just. You know, a little bit challenging. I got a lot of things going on. A lot of yeah. things going on. Yeah. But um, if we have a need for it. It's just you know we can't require kids to take these courses. Yeah. It really has to be a family decision. And unfortunately, um, I wish we could run a tiered instruction class because I, I think the kids that were in it, they improved and it had benefit. Um, it's just a little bit more challenging at our level. I think what you're doing is in, to, to that point, probably trying to change the culture. Yeah. Change you know. Friday came, okay, we don't have to worry about anything anymore. Right. Learning stopped. When in all actuality, it doesn't. Right, right. But, you know, good job with the effort, but I understand where, <laughs> you know, and it, like I said, you're changing, trying to change a culture that you need the constant um, intervention to continue to learn. So. Right. I mean, like I said, we have kids that need it. Right. Um, it's not enough to, unfortunately, mm -hmm. run a course, but. Yeah. Um, but if they're just getting by, they don't see the need. That's right. where the problem is. That's the, that's the, it's the branding issue. It is yeah. the branding yeah. issue. Yeah. No matter how you slice it, high school kids are smart. Yeah. They know they know what that course means and they know. Yeah, just ask them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, moving along. Okay, so at the district level, uh, we've had and we'll continue to have a goal that's around our climate and engaging um, our full learning community as well as the community at large. It's, much of what we just discussed through goals one and two cannot happen if you're not providing students with a structured, nurturing, and respectful learning and working environment. And that's actually true for adults as well. And that comes through everyone's work here, but it also comes through our work with partners in the community and our work with our parents as we continue to partner, partner with them pre-K through 12 focus may change as you go to the different buildings um, targeted specifically on some of the things that that building community may look to um, increase uh, results on a positive level but uh, the concept is the same so if you look at the next slide uh, from a district-wide perspective uh, some of the things that we've been concentrating on over the last year and almost two years is working with our ELPS youth safety Committee, which um, brings in a number of partnering community agencies or community groups. Um, this year we had two parent and um, family nights, if you will, that uh, were very well attended and have provided us feedback to continue working on how do we build a list of effective resources to help support our students who may be struggling with some of these issues. Um, we also continue to work very closely with our district attorney's office. We had two students on the youth advisory board. We're working to select at least two more students. The hope will be that we actually um, have juniors next year so that uh, students can go through two years on that advisory board, uh, which I think will be very beneficial. Having East Long Meadow students on that youth advisory board, um, it's not only beneficial just for our students collaborating and um, problem solving with other students from the region. It's also beneficial as that group comes back, which this year they did um, for our third and fourth graders, to see our own high school students up there presenting. Uh, that have, goes a long way with our younger students. We started a partnership uh, which has paid some nice dividends with Academy Hill around um, gifted and talented programming that uh, not only brought us some um, international visitors from Iceland. Many of you actually uh, stopped in to meet our international visitors. But it also started to look at, as well as um, gave us, a, uh, I think Mr. Fredette termed it as a learning celebration. Um, 
in October, we had an outside group looking at our gifted and talented program and really complimenting us on our push-in portion, um, which is not something that um, districts around the state or maybe throughout the nation do regularly and consistently as much as we do. Um, with that help and some ongoing discussions, we then as um, central office administrators and elementary school administrators as well as our gifted and talented teachers started to look at how we structure that program and, and we're beginning to make some changes which I think will benefit all our students. Um, you've heard about the math programming and professional mm -hmm. development. We also did three parent nights in the fall around that which were well attended. Um, and we continue to look for ways to bring information to our parents that is going to make sense and help them understand what we're doing. One of those was as we moved into our standards-based report card, we provided a training that was um, expertly narrated, mostly by Mrs. Lanier, but um, I had a few pieces where maybe just below the expert level um, where we provided um, some training and, and insight into that report card. And so that may be a vehicle that we use um, down the road, continue to use, and that was on our webpage. The next slide uh, just gives you a look at some of these community events. Uh, you have our Youth Advisory Board, and that's actually one of our East Long Meadows students up there presenting. Uh, that was at Mountain View. Then we, uh, the parent night that was held in December, that's one of our panel speakers, um, that picture right there, and that was probably one of the more um, riveting moments through that whole uh, presentation. That's a former East Long Meadow, or it is an East Long Meadow High School alum, former East Long Meadow student, um, came back and is giving up his time. And then you see um, the, the audience perspective on that same night um, as they look at not only different things on screen, but you have your panel speakers over there to the right. <coughs> Give you an idea of what's, how that's working in the schools. We'll move to our elementary schools first. So in striving to increase um, parent and family engagement and two-way communication with families, we hosted a few um, family information nights. Um, Gordon spoke to one of them. We had a math information night, and we actually had teachers present lessons to familiarize parents with the new Eureka math program. Um, but this is um, uh, a picture of uh, a part of a slideshow, and it was called Solving the Worry Puzzle. And our two phenomenal counselors, Betsy Sheehan and Joe Hudson, facilitated this workshop for families. And uh, the focus was really to help provide parents with some strategies to help their children with anxiety. We also had a parent um, help facilitate uh, a little bit on breathing um, and on yoga. In addition to that, we have also had some family activity events. So without getting too much into the data here, one of our measures of success in this area is our parent survey, which we give not just to our exiting families, but to all of our families K-2. We want to catch them before they're leaving so that we can make those improvements. Um, so just taking a look at this year's data in a very broad sense, uh, it was very overwhelmingly positive, I believe, all of but two scored at an 80% agreement rate or better. Our lowest one was uh, 74 and we really only had two in the 70s. What we do with this data each year is we sit down and look at it, both just Lisa and I, and then we look at it with our school council, which includes parents and staff members as well. From this data we determine three areas usually that we want to focus on in the upcoming school year. So not looking at the data that you have up here, but looking at the data from the year before, which we were working on all year this year. We focused on the areas of students in my child's school respect differences in other students. I feel that learning expectations are clearly communicated, and I feel that there are adults' programs and procedures in place to challenge my child in math. Some of the things we put in place this year um, to help with these areas as we expanded our second steps program as we've explained to you a few times in the past we had just a first grade model we've expanded that now to include K-2 to with the help of a grant from ELEAF. We've also hosted which you'll see in a few more slides an amazing international night last year was our first year that our PTO helped organize this and this year we expanded to include Maple Shade and Mountain View as well in our international celebration. 
We've also, um, in terms of communicating learning expectations, do that through family newsletters, teacher newsletters, math information night, and other parent nights. And then we, in terms of challenging kids in math, we've adopted a new math curriculum that is very rigorous, very aligned with the Common Core State Standards, and worked really hard this year to put some interventions in place and to um, acquire that position for the math coach to complete the coaching model. So what we're gonna do now with the data that you were actually just looking at is meet with our team in the fall to determine what areas we're gonna work on going forward. How did you uh, conduct the survey? Was it on survey monkey? Yes, survey monkey. What was the rate around, remember? Say that again. Return rate. 100, I wanna say 120, 119 this year. Uh, we have 570. Uh, yeah, we're 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 gonna jump on uh, something that Elaine maybe can t tell everyone what she does as well. There's a little incentive. There's there's a, pr a th uh, extra printed uh, page that after the parent um, completes it, they print it out, and what do they get, Elaine? Well, it depends on which room they're in. Each room gave out a different. I'm doing type that next year. <laughs> I didn't. I still didn't get the return rate I wanted doing that, but yeah, um, twenty percent isn't bad. So yeah, I know we want the, more. I, I know. To start out and just keep going forward, I think is good. They, they printed off of Survey Monkey. Yes. I can show you. Good idea. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah. So on on this one, just really quickly, our Meadowbrook second step, um, just to let you know, and I think. Um, Renee had talked a little bit about it, but we have expanded this program, and Betsy and Joe have met with every um, classroom. So there's 25 classes, 10 times. So they met, uh, they had facilitated 250 second step classes. Um, and basically, it's a social emotional skills program, and it teaches kids empathy, problem solving, uh, emotional management, and also focusing and attention and listening skills. So this was a survey that they gave to teachers and the, blue, the question was overall, do you see your students solving problems with one another effectively? And the blue was before receiving second step instruction and the red was after seeing it. And you can kind of see that positive shift where um, with the red after they received it, we've eliminated the strongly disagree and we have um, more strong, strongly agree. And then just a few pictures because how cute are those kids? Um, we had an amazing family international night that included so many different things, food, traditional clothing, artifacts and pottery from other cultures, music and dance. Uh, we had a lot of families come in traditional clothing, which was fantastic to see. Lots of great food, lots of great conversations between the families, and I think it was um, just a wonderful night and very glad we could expand that to include the other two schools this year. And in addition to these, we've had family pizza night, family reading night, math informational night, donuts with dad, which was wildly successful morning event that may have wreaked a little havoc on the parking situation. Um, family picnic and I, I kind of regretted after the fact that we had family picnic so close to when we put this together because could have shown you some great video of Lisa getting dunked in the dunk tank. Oh. Oh. And I, did, I, did. I was at that family picnic. What an amazing event I that I know. that was. I know. It was incredible. The best. Yeah. It, it was, was awesome. Incredible. There was a the line for the dunk tank was. Mm -hmm. Well, when you put an yeah. administrator up there, <laughs> yeah. it's obvious mm -hmm. why. Yeah. And Mr. Cushman even came back and put himself up there in the dunk tank as well. So it was, it was a great event. And then we also had a month-long spotlight on, um, actually a little over a month-long spotlight on Focus for Kindness that was really tied um, to working to raise funds for Team Isabella. And throughout that time, we were recognizing the small acts of kindness that kids were doing each and every day and building a paper chain, which ended up starting off with three links and spanning a good portion of our cafeteria by the time it was done. Good. I think I'm going to show my stupidity right now with this question. You can't do exit surveys with the students in grade two, for example. Exit service of students. Are no, we're kind we're difficult. yeah, we're just doing the parent <laughs> survey. I mean, we could create something. I just don't just ask. You. Have to think creatively around that one, Rich. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, um, this year was the first year that we surveyed all students at Mountain View. We were just doing an exit survey of the fifth graders. So these are the results 
There was only about 10 questions on the survey, so I just picked the ones that I felt were the most important for you to see. The lowest scoring one in the whole survey was Mountain View students respect each other. In the past, that was Mountain View students respect each other's differences. Mm -hmm. And it was always the lowest uh, scoring question. So we thought maybe they didn't understand the question, so we changed it and we still didn't get um, <laughs> different results. The problem is I eliminated two years ago the sometimes button because I found I was getting 40% of kids hitting sometimes. I think they were just going click, 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 yeah. click, instead of thinking about the question. So I made them agree or disagree. So in a lot of the comments, they literally said, could you add a sometimes button? Because sometimes we respect each other, but sometimes we don't. So it's they went with the negative when they answered the question, but in their comments want me to add a sometimes button. Well, it's an interesting uh, observation. Yes, they, they did mention it, so yes. we will do it. Okay. But even though you, you used the phrase low, it's three out of four students. Yes, so I know. Yeah. I just, the rest of them are so high that right. it, is, it, right. it, felt, yeah. it felt low. I mean, I'm glad they feel welcome and I know they know who to go to with a problem, but. Yeah. Um, and then we, were, we did the parent survey and I had a 52% response rate, wow. which good. is high, That's but. Good. I was hoping with the incentive it would be even higher, but. Um, well, you, you just got to build up it, that's all. Yes. Um, so I was happy that I combined two questions in statement number one. One was my child's happy at Mountain View, one was my child feels safe, but both came back at 100%, which I was really happy with. I mean, yeah. if they're happy and safe, then they're learning, is my feeling. So I'm glad they feel that way. The lowest one was 93%. Um, both my child and I are kept aware of how my child is doing in school. Still very high, um, but that was um, the lowest scoring percentage. They're happy with our bullying curriculum, communication, and I'm assuming the 4% that didn't <laughs> like the discipline. I meant anti-bullying, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. It's 9 o'clock. Yeah. School just ended. Um, I'm assuming the 4% who aren't happy with the discipline received some type of discipline. Yes. Right. So. And then the pictures, uh, this was a great assembly the PTO just brought to us during the last week of school. It was African drummers and dancers. The kids had a blast. If you go online, you can see videos. I won't encourage it because I'm in one, but oh, wow. um, they are on our website. Jeremiah is really the one you want to see. Um, he has his own link, so I would check that out. Um, these pictures are just pictures of different things that have gone on at the school this year, starting at the top left is our garden. Um, and I just love that picture of Colby, so I had to put it up there. Um, so they go out to the garden, different classes all throughout the year. They plant, they weed, they dig, they do everything out there. Um, field day, top right. The bottom right is our staff versus staff volleyball game. Oh, Greg, your daughter's in the picture. She is. Uh, I didn't even know that until right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's a that's a popular event. We actually raised close to three thousand dollars, or a little more than three thousand dollars for the PTO. Oh, this was rocking. Yes, it was. Yeah. And then the last picture is our science night, which the PTO and two of my fifth grade teachers, uh, one fifth grade teacher and the GT teacher organized, which was very successful. That's it. So you just have to tell us about your incentive. Um, oh, okay. So the la if you go on SurveyMonkey, you can make the last page be just a statement that says thank you for taking our survey. So when I told the parents about it, I told them to print the last page and bring it in. And the kids would receive some kind of incentive from their teacher. So some teachers have jars of cubes in their room. And if they accumulate yeah, a certain amount of cubes, they get cubes, cubes like little plastic cubes. Yeah. And what do you do with it? If they get to a certain point, they get a movie. They get yeah. a, um, extra recess. Insane. Yeah. Something like that. No, they don't get the cube. They fill the jar to a certain a point and they get a reward. So if everyone brought in the printed page, yes. then they oh, get a lot, it would fill up the jar. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that nice? so. I didn't get it either, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, she's humoring you. <laughs> I got it. Okay. Very good. Thank so you. 
Don't call us Mr. Fidel. This is just, you know, come on. Go ahead. One thing that I need to eliminate is the I don't know button. Um, so, <laughs> so these numbers don't add up to 100%. Obviously. <laughs> right. And so about 100 students filled this out for fifth grade exit survey. And so every percentage is one student. Um, it's, the, the students that disagreed were very, very low with any of these statements except for the Maple Shade students respect each other. So rather than look at the 64% agree, I kind of looked at the 16% disagree. So there's kind of 16 students out there in fifth grade that feel like students don't respect each other. Um, I was a little disappointed. We did do work around this. This is the one, much like Elaine, that says comes out the lowest every year. And uh, we increased our second step um, programming as well, at, specifically at the fifth grade level, um, where every student receives second step instruction. Um, we used um, an inventory assessment called a Sabres assessment that teachers fill out, which kind of screens the students for some maybe at-risk criteria or some criteria that requires a counseling intervention. So we provided small group counseling interventions for the areas according to the Sabres assessment. So I was a little disappointed when this came out. I know it's 16 students that really disagree with this, but we're gonna continue working on that and continue working in this area. It'll probably be a very, very, very um, immediate meeting that I'd hold at the beginning of the school year to sort of brainstorm how we can do better um, in this area. Um, so that's the student survey results. The parent results, um, they don't have the sometimes or don't know button. So this was great. They, um, the, uh, all of the results were very, very high, all in the 90s. Um, nothing was in the 80s, which I was really happy about. Um, so the area on this one was my child knows who to go to if they have a problem. So. That was 92% feel like they do know who to go to, but that was our lowest. Um, so maybe we can work with third graders early on in that area so they do know that going into the building. Here's our school climate photos. I tried to focus on um, the photos where parents were involved. So school climate involved staff, students, and parents. Um, the first photo was our uh, JB's Ice Cream Factory Scoopathon that we did at the beginning of the year. So those are two staff members, um, Mrs. McCauley and Mrs. Stocks, that were scooping ice cream. That was a wonderful event. Uh, there was a lot, a lot of families showed up for that. Um, and then we had a, a hike to Skinner State Park where parents were involved to hike with their students as well. This was a fourth grade um, field trip. It looked at um, uh, geology and rock formations in the um, curriculum frameworks. and that was at Skinner State Park. That was an excellent day. The next one um, at the top left, that was the um, robotics amusement park generate an uh, open-ended um, problem to solve and build um, an amusement park ride with your robot. Parents were invited into that showcase. Then we had a STARS going from top left to top right, a STARS residency grant that we applied for and were awarded. Um, that was for um, $4,600. This was Motoko, um, who is a professional Japanese storyteller, and she worked on storytelling and folk tales and writing and reading, EL, mainly some really important ELA standards that students did excellent work and parents were invited for their showcase. And then the bottom two is our immigration simulation. This was a, a project-based learning opportunity for fourth grade students. I felt like this was probably the best example of project-based uh, project learning I've seen. This spanned every curricular area, every content area in the curriculum you could imagine. Students learned exactly what it was like to get their fare to America, arrive to Ellis Island, what they went through in Ellis Island. And the, the picture of the um, Italian immigrants in front of the Coliseum, that is our green screen technology in our tech club studio that we use. Um, so we could actually put the homeland behind all of the students when presenting. So we incorporated technology at high levels as well. Um, this event was excellent. It was absolutely the, my favorite event of the school year. And the reminder did a nice article on it last, last week. It was great. Uh, I always love to see um, that statement. We know my child, uh, uh, the student said, I know who to go to if I have a problem. Yeah. And all of them are in the high 80s or high 90s, which is wonderful to know that they feel they have adults in this building, no matter what building they're in, 
they can go if they have a problem. So kudos to K through five. And then I came crashing down. They get more cynical. Um, so for the first time ever, we did exit surveys with all three grades, which we were really excited we did. And we tailored the exit surveys to the grade. So we asked like grade level appropriate questions. Um, we do have the unsure button. So we got a lot of unsures, which are not on here. So I, I did put that at the bottom once I uh, realized how it looked that the opposite is not disagree. Uh, in a lot of cases, disagree was low. I probably should have shown that. Um, but for the first time ever, we got really good formative data from the students. And we did it in a way where they even selected what team they're on. So when teams get back, we'll be able to give each team, um, it was, I think it was 35 or 40 survey questions. Um, per grade, so we'll be able to really give teams information on how their students felt when they left um, their their experience this this year, um, and then so you can see the numbers there. I don't need to go necessarily through those, but then the other thing was um, Connor, who had to leave, um, really talked me into putting open-ended questions in the survey, and it was amazing the level of feedback we got from the kids in the open-ended questions. It might take half the summer to read through all of it, but uh, some really good ideas and some really good feedback um, on how we can keep working. Uh, I would argue the most positive on that first one is the bottom. Um, at the end of the day, if I can get our teachers to build positive relationships with students and for young adolescents to be reporting that they did that at an 87, a 69, and a 78 percent, that's that's pretty strong. Uh, culture pictures, bottom left, field day. We did for the second year in a row three different field days, which was great. I'm so glad we have this up and running again. Um, top picture is you know technology was really new to us this year. We went from zero carts to three Chrome carts this year, so. It was great to just be walking around and see that in places. And then the bottom right is our tech ed class where they build uh, paper cars that run off wind and have races. Uh, so that was a cool thing to stumble into as well. Doctor, I gotta push a little bit. I mean, I'm a little surprised by that statistic you showed because all five of us are in the community and in different ways. And we hear really wonderful things about the climate of Birchland Park. So I'm a little taken aback that, I mean, most of those schools are pretty high if you look at them, but I mean, um, I guess I would have, I mean, I guess, um, especially the top one, I mean, you still get 70%, 75% saying that, you know, that they have, they know who to go to if they have a problem. The bottom part also about teachers trying to build a positive relationship. So within this, there's, there's a lot of positive there. I want, I, I would ask you to look at your survey closer to see if the wording could be better. I'm just saying that. But what I'm hearing in the community about Birchland Park Middle School. Oh yeah, for sure, a absolutely, um, and, we, and we'll look at it a lot closer. But when you think about the, the questions, like two out of three sixth graders felt comfortable going to the pr principal or the assistant principal right. like with a problem. Like that's a really high number yeah, of young is. adolescents saying they would go to an yeah. administrator. Um, even in eighth grade, that over half of them said they would yeah. actually come to yeah. an administrator. But that's a high, that's a, yeah, I mean, I would love to see these numbers be in the 80s and 90s too. Right. Um, also, just so you know, we asked two or three questions around each topic. So and we asked them in like, <coughs> like a negative way, in a positive way, yeah. and then we, we, we combine them together. So it's not just as simple as like one question. Like right. we try to hide the construct in like a, 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 a young adolescent level question. Uh, so yeah, but again, first time we've done this. But um, when you, when you compare young adolescents to three through five, there's going to be a huge difference in the way that they, the kids, just through the way they're growing, <laughs> the way they approach things. So I don't think the data is all that bad. You, there are positives there because they, even as middle school, they still feel comfortable going to the principal, which you would see that in three through five, but you would see it starting to wane a little bit, in my opinion as they progress through. Yeah, I was happy with the administrator one. I, the top row I'm happy with, I mean, I'm basically, right. if you look at the top yeah. row, seven out of 10 young adolescents still yeah. feel comfortable with teachers. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but this is so a middle good. school, I mean, as a former high school person, I don't know why anybody wants to teach or be a middle school. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> so I just, you know, I, mean, I think it's a whole different. They, they don't even know what's going on. Really, middle school students. I mean, they just, well, they, they, uh, I, I think, think they, they do just, because they're they're getting. I just, no, but I know, think like, the up. unsure button is huge. Yeah, I, I, I think especially in middle school. Yeah. Before it was fifth grade in my school, they were always clicking it, so I can only imagine. But the, and that's what I said, you know. But but I still think that there's positives going on. Oh, there on. is. I just because to Rich's point, we do hear it. We do hear of all the good things. So I wouldn't consider that to be a huge pickup no, at all. I don't know. Sorry. Continue to revise. Service. Yeah. Well, no. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we want to continue to grow those numbers, okay. even though unsure existed. I mean, sure. this is still real data, and we surveyed 650 kids to get it. So we want to keep building. So we've been doing a survey for many years, and we try to cover a ton of different topics. So this is just a sampling, but we do things like um, try to get a handle on how our kids do outside of school, so if they work, how many hours a week do they spend on homework. I mean, we, you, you've probably seen it before, but it's very comprehensive. So this is, and I couldn't share the open response because I think some of it was PG-13, maybe even rated R, some of the responses that we got from our students. So we deal with a whole different type of... Uh, uh, kind of uh, situation with this, with the surveys at the high school. Um, it was really important for us this year, and by the way, the survey was created by our principal's advisory committee. We kind of revised it this year. We really wanted to get an indication of how we're doing with our mission statement because we really have tried to make our mission statement a living, breathing thing in all we do and all our PD. It's always, everything's always connected back to that. I'm really proud that our students felt um, that the first, the, the number one thing they think that we do the best was just striving for success, pushing them to be the best that they can be in all different areas. And super excited to see that honoring diversity came in into um, second place because I feel like we have done so much um, in so that they area. Had to choose like one, two, three, they had to rank them. Right. They had to rank them. So um, this is the ranking. Uh, third place was engaging critical thinking, and then fourth place was learning collaboratively. Um, and this, the survey, uh, the senior survey and the um, underclassmen survey is done separately. So that question came up later that we should probably put that on. So that's why you don't see it on grade 12. Um, as you know, next year we're starting an advisor advisee program. So we really wanted to get some feedback from the kids in terms as what are some topics that are near and dear to your hearts. Um, kids really want to talk more about social media and how they react and interact on social media. So that's when we come back from um, the summer, that's going to be our first one. We had a lot of comments on how to deal with peer pressure, um, tolerance and acceptance of others, drug and alcohol and dating violence tied. So that is definitely an area that we want to um, touch next year in some of those some of those sessions. Issues with sexual relations was that was um, actually we had a column that was write in. You could write in any topic. That was the number one um, topic that our students wanted to talk about. So whatever that means. So <laughs> we'll figure it out. And then last place. Um, Mental illness. Uh, that was another big write-in. You know, kids wanted to to talk about how it affects them, how it affects their friends, and how it affects their family. Um, we've we've adopted a program next year to kind of help us generate those conversations. So it's a video that's done um, by a famous skateboarder. So it's somebody that's kind of cool to them, and then um, it's going to have guided questions for the class to dis to discuss with their teachers. Um, so we're we're really looking forward to reporting out next year of how that goes. I think it's going to be really really strong. It's going to be at least once a month to start and then if it if it does well we might think to increase it. Um, another positive I think that came out of it is that I think that if you look at the data our kids really feel challenged at the high school. Um, that was a, a big plus for us and then um, the question if you need someone to talk to, 82 percent of the um, underclassmen felt that they had that um, person and 90 percent of our seniors felt that they had at least one person that they could talk to which I think for this age group is huge. Um, so no, going to the next picture, I had to put Gronkowski out there because it was just so cool. And we had, it was our most tweeted tweet of the year, too, so it was kind of neat to have him there. Um, but I wanted to kind of highlight some of the things that we've been working on this year. You know, we're very, very focused next year in integrating more technology and not just to have computers, but to increase the collaboration with the kids communication. That picture on the right is a picture taken out of our collaborative learning lab this year and uh, love going in there because anytime you go in there you're going to see kids that are involved in rigorous conversations with each other utilizing the technology as a resource. So as you can see here that was a group of students that were given a guiding question in science class and they had to work collaboratively to come up with a claim supporting evidence. Um, it's pretty comprehensive. Um, so we're trying to increase those types of activities. 
our library renovation is going really strong today they knocked down windows or glass and um, cabinets and it's just we're so excited because that's just going to be another place for our kids to um, collaborate and and just have a place where they can go that's comfortable and encourages them to 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 think and to learn um, our new schedule got approved really strongly this year so we're very excited to see how that's going to um, generate any positives uh, another thing I'm very thankful for and thank to Gordon and to Pam for helping high school get this off the ground is our one-to-one -one initiative is finally going to happen um, for next year. We have 25 students right now who are going to be taking home a laptop um, from the, you know, from throughout the school day. They can take it home and um, they're going to be utilizing us in our community action learning class, which has really gotten some good feedback from the community. Last week we sent out an email to all the town department chairs, um, just kind of letting them know that this class is going to be going on. Kids are probably going to start talking to you. We'd like you to be part of the panel presentations. And I almost heard from every single department chair, like, we're excited and here are some questions and issues we want the kids to like think about. So it's going to be a great balance of you know, getting the kids out in the community getting them to learn different skills that they're going to require when they go to college, when they you know, get out in the workforce, and then utilizing the technology. So really excited about that. Um, next year, our art teachers are introducing a new component to their art class. We, we create a new Google Lab. They're going to be using um, iPhones and um, digital technology and integrating that into art, which is going to be utilized with our Chromebooks. So we're seeing a lot more technology in, in the um, electives as well. And there you have it. Great year at the high school. We're collaborating with um, our DPW on the renovation project. <laughs> yes, there you go. Problem solving. Thank you. Yes. There you go. I have to give a shout you out to DPW. They've been great. Absolutely. They've been fantastic. Um, that we phased that so that it wasn't a, a hit to any one particular year budget. So we're working very closely with them, um, with the high school, and with the um, high school librarian to make this happen. Now on that, are there still going to be some quiet areas or quiet rooms where students can just sit and read or have some quiet downtime? Um, yes and no. So one of the things that we did is they're install installing it this week, um, you know, where the computer lab is in the back and it meets the library. There's a glass door that's going to separate those two rooms so that you know, it kind of keeps the library a little bit more quiet. Really the noise comes from the lab pieces because that's where the teachers right. are teaching. Um, but, you know, most libraries right now are big open spaces. We're going to have lounge areas for kids to just, you know, kind of work on projects together, which is something we, we have. We don't have a lot of those spaces at the high school. Right. We're really limited. But even in the newer designs, they're not libraries anymore. They're, no, they're, they're like media yeah. centers. Right. They're wide so, open. Yeah, they're wide spaces. open. There aren't those, what you think of as, in terms of a traditional library. And just, we're really limited square footage right. in the library, oh, too. Yeah. So there's not really a whole lot of quiet no. corners. So the collaborative piece, the um, ability to problem solve together, we'll be able to handle that. Um, yeah. The technology piece we're still working on, but it goes back to, say, our electrical system being at capacity. Yeah. Um, and so that's, again, we're working very closely with DPW. To IT see. has also been really great, that's too. That's right. That's a good point. <laughs> IT has been with us all the way through, and, and what do you... It's sad to say this, but what do you literally unplug right. in order to plug in something else? Um, and so we're going through that and seeing what makes sense, what maybe we can unplug so that we can make that space better. Okay. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Maybe just have another couple hours worth of work. Yeah, we're going to keep going. <laughs> Okay, moving right along. Uh, Pam, <laughs> Pam, Pam, go ahead. Okay, uh -huh. everybody's tired. Boom. Can we just move to accept? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I move to accept the uh, benefit, the donation of $179. All right. It's going to go right to it. I mean, we don't reach out for the A-plus school reward program. I second it. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 I move that we accept the donation of $50 from Target Take Charge for Education <laughs> for Burson Park. I second it. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 I move that we accept the $755 from Elementary Music Night. On, it's a donation from the Elementary Music Night on June 8th from Meadowbrook. Is there more to that? 
Right, do other schools get that? Or is it self-explanatory? There, there's other no. schools that will be coming will in be as well, but I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah. No, no, no. Ticket no. no. sales, yeah. Ticket yeah. sales, so, yeah. So, yeah. So, yes, exactly. Yeah. And this, cool. this is the way the outside auditors want it handled. It goes into the right. gift account. Oh, That's the appropriate place. I, see. Okay. I second it. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, Mr. that. Okay, moving along to uh, old business six point item six six point one, uh, the superintendent summative evaluation. This was kind of difficult because we did our mid cycle seven weeks ago, so there wasn't a whole lot of substance to add. So I will quickly go through what I got from everybody, and, and I thank everybody for for submitting. Under progress towards student learning goals, everything that I that I added is highlighted in red. The district continues to make progress. There were increases in the aggregate CPI in both ELA and mathematics. There's also good success in PARC. The district continues to align with the Mass State Standards. <clears throat> progress towards professional practice goals. A collaborative, effort, a collaborative effort was used to choose Mastery Connect, Connect as our software package. Both programs were piloted before a choice was made. Moving along to um, SMART Goal 3, which is um, yeah, continue to build relationships with other town departments. This will be crit critical moving forward with the change in form of town government taking place uh, on July 1st. Um, instructional leadership. The superintendent has worked effectively with the software pilot committee. He is also involved in the MIAA and works in collaboration with the LPBEC districts. His leadership has also led to great progress as seen from the longitudinal data formed from the past few years. Under management and operations, the district continues to run smoothly. The superintendent and leadership team continue to make our school district a safe and great learning environment. Moving along to family and community engagement, the superintendent continues to be highly visible in the community. This again will be important as we move forward. Professional culture, the superintendent continues to demonstrate the professional culture in the examples he sets, expanding the East Long Meadow Public Schools learning walks and working ELPS assessment, so working with the ELPS mm -hmm. assessment software pilot committee. And just in a, in a short summary, in reviewing the superintendent's summative evaluation report from 2015-2016, the East Long Meadow Public School System is continuing to make effective progress on a number of in initiatives. The superintendent continues to focus his efforts on the students. He also continues to make efforts to increase technology for all students. This is important as we move, move forward. The superintendent will also need to continue to work with other depart town department heads and establish relationships with the new town council to make sure they they understand our needs going forward. Well done, Mr. Fonsi. Yes, yes, very nice. Well done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Well, very well done. <laughs> She's very well, actually. Yeah. <laughs> no. No. It's, it, it's a, a cumulative effort. It is. Yeah, there's, it there's is. no yeah. way that uh, I can be effective in my job without all of you and without the entire school system, as you've said a few times other town departments and yeah. um, agencies that uh, mm -hmm. continue to support us. And I think, you know, we see that as, you know, a need to continue to grow as we go forward. So, mm -hmm. very good. Thank you. Okay, under new business, item 7.1, the MASC MA. Yeah. Oh, I think you have I'm to sorry. To accept this. I'm yeah. sorry. I move, I move to accept the superintendent's summative evaluation for school year 2015 2016. I'll There's second it. Any further discussion? <coughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, I apologize for that. Okay, item 7.1 under new business, MASC, MASS joint conference early bird registration. In your packet, and I received this in the mail, um, MASC always offers early registration, um, an early re registration window for the annual conference in Hyannis. Um, it'll be, the, the deadline is on or before July 15th, 2016. Um, I plan on going. I'll reach out to Beth and see what her plans are. I'm not sure if anybody else is going to be interested or not, and we'll go forward. If anybody ever has any questions on that, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 
Moving on to item 7.2, East Long Meadow Tennis Association request for a bulletin board at the tennis courts. Hey, in your um, informational packet, you have a letter from Karen Fothrop Myers, who's uh, secretary and board member of the East Long Meadow Tennis Association. And if you remember, um, Karen also was part of the uh, steering committee as we started to put together that capital project to renovate the tennis courts. Um, the request is twofold, one of which is um, relatively easy. Uh, right now you have smaller rule sign, uh, tennis court rules posted um, on each of the doors. They were provided by the original contractor and it does make sense um, to now put up something that's a little bit more permanent similar to what we do in the athletic stadium that just states the rules so that people can see them very clearly um, on any of the entrances to the tennis courts. That's the second part of the request. Um, and that's something that we can, I've already had discussions with our DPW, did the signs for our athletic stadium. Um, if that's something that they feel they no longer can do, we can then reach out. I know that um, the East Lima Tennis Association has spoken to Spotlight Graphics. We also have done work with um, Hamden, um, is it Hamden Graphics or Hamden Sign? Hamden um, Sign, yeah. And uh, they do nice work as well. So we can, that's something I, I think would make sense and certainly we do with our other uh, facilities. Um, so you'll be working with the, the DPW, correct? I would work with DPW if that's something that they feel they no longer, they're no longer in the sign business per se, then you know we would reach out to some of the other companies that uh, okay. we've used before. Um, and that's making the rules a little bit more prominent and clearer for all individuals who use the tennis courts. Um, in, we've experienced some people uh, on weekends mostly when tennis courts are not in use. Um, who have done some skateboarding and so forth and even though the signs say you know, skateboarding, yeah. it'd be good to post that clear. The second uh, request, or actually the first request in the letter, is a request from the Tennis Association to put up um, a protected all-weather bulletin board on which we can post um, programs such as the recreation department tennis clinics that are going on it's going throughout uh, the summer and the fall um, as well as when high school team practices happen when um, rec tennis programs are happening more information so that people who are coming by may want to use the courts. They know when the courts are in use, when the courts may be free for um, other uh, citizens to use, as well as just advertising and increasing the sport of tennis. Um, I think that's the goal is, from the Tennis Association is they have these oh, incredible... Oh, promoting, not advertising. Rob, sorry. <laughs> promoting, yeah. promoting the sport of tennis as a, a lifelong sport, if you will. Um, I have not had extensive conversations with Karen um, or other members of the East Long Meadow Tennis Association, but I think they certainly would respect the fact that um, right now the school committee does not look to advertise companies, either in the athletic stadium or the gymnasium, and therefore I'm assuming that would also apply to the tennis courts. So we would have to make that clear if that's the committee's um, wishes that uh, nothing but current tennis programming and you know, expansion of tennis as a lifelong sport. Is the high school administration a thought director weighed in on this? They have not. Um, I can certainly get their recommendation. I would definitely be interested in hearing about mm -hmm. it. I think it's a unique situation. Um, we don't have other sports that currently do this, correct? We don't no. have. We don't. No. No. I also think it's one of these uh, areas right now where we have that crossover. It's not like people are coming to use the football field for their own use, mm -hmm. but with the right. tennis, we are using it, opening it up to the community to use. Right. Um, at times we're not, and it can be confusing as to, okay, do you think if I go there now I'd be able to use the tennis courts? Is it okay? Um, I think it might help eliminate some of those questions, but I'd really be interested to hear what the high school staff would have to yeah, say about it first. I, I agree with that. Okay. Well, isn't that solved though by simply stay, making it a time that these courts are available on a daily basis? Yeah, but how, where do you post that or where do you, you know, show that? 
Um, yeah, but it shouldn't be more general than specific. My issue is yeah. with this. I don't. I don't see how they could ever schedule when the courts will be available and not available by a, on a piece of paper right. locked up in a glass cover. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think you're much much more. You know, the courts are open to the public after four from four p.m. to dusk. Or so I don't know what the rule is. I mean, the only thing that they could post is when the matches are. Like let's we, say we would have, have to post our varsity schedules. Yeah. That's what that's right. It, the spring season, or, you know, they have night. you would have no, well, they're after conflicts. school, yeah, after school. and they can go into right. So they either practice or they have a match, right? Yeah. So they're right. not available probably before before four o'clock, four o'clock, or whatever yeah. the time is, yeah. Right? yeah. So that's the issue. We just make it a general rule it's open to the public from 4 p.m. till dusk. <clears throat> I don't know that we can keep this up to date, is the only thing because I yeah. think we're, mm -hmm. we're all much more. Uh, Online oh, my understanding too before. was that it was the tennis club that would want to keep it. It is up a tennis. Date. It is a tennis yeah. club. They're asking so, so I don't know how they're going to coordinate with the, the school so, and the rec yeah. to keep it updated too. So other than that, it just becomes outdated information. Correct. And is anybody going to read it anyway? Or I appreciate it, the effort, but it could, is there something they can accomplish online? That's what I was going to say. Yeah. You know, Facebook. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. We could even post if, you know if we came to a consensus. You know, for I, schedule I think, updates, um, go here. I think you're certainly the, you're hitting a, a very valid point. Mm -hmm. Communication of rec programs, I'm sure, are well documented on the rec website. That's correct. We have our um, schedule. It, this would be in addition to. Right. But I don't know if it's the intent is to advertise other programs, not necessarily, or not advertise, but post for other programs, not necessarily school it specific is, is and that's what I'm afraid that intent yeah. Is. Yeah, is and that I think approaches the gray area oh, yeah. right. of advertising mm -hmm. because of our advertising policy what is to preclude somebody from saying this is sponsored by so-and-so and where it's not really advertising but it's running up a, right up against it right. and that's where I have a concern right. and then we have to be approving everything that we have posted. to be approving yeah. everything yeah. That, yeah. and yeah. that is that or even someone who wants to give private Tennis lessons correct in posts inside that. Well, you can't do that. Well, but you could. Well, we don't have the key. You know, that's right. my but, point. Though, right. you know, we don't have the key. So I, it's it's what yeah. they want to put in there. Ready for this? Not school yeah. specific, yeah. and I don't think we're ready for it. Yeah. So they need to come up with their own like electronic bulletin board. Yeah, or that, just like the website. Said, we'll their website. We post the website. Yeah. 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 Salmon Tennis. It's for right. more yeah. information, go to eltennis.org or whatever it is. I think we could certainly be accommodated. Well, I think we can. Something like that. I think we can. Yeah. But not really something like information out there. Would you um, like to take them separately in terms of the rules? Yeah, uh, I think we have to. the rule sign and um, whatever you may be thinking in terms of a motion for the bulletin board? Oh, well. Okay. Well, we have, yeah, we have to because I think we're in agreement that the rules should be posted. Correct. They're not posted ad adequately well, now. They're not. They're right not now, that you have the original manufacturer sign oh, yeah. um, in their small. They're blue. Right. It'd be nice to make yeah. them white. Maybe put the Spartan as they showed in their drawing on it, and, and make them a little bit larger so that it's clear. Here's the expectation as you come out of the courts. Who but creates then, the rules? I, <coughs> uh, basically, I think they've provided some recommendations, but we would work with our athletic director, high school administration, um, and we have models of what we already have in okay. place in the athletic stadium. Cool. We, so some of the keys are obviously proper footwear. Right. What the they tennis courts are intended <coughs> for, and what it's not intended for. Okay. I will entertain a motion to approve the request, or do I have a motion on the East Long Meadow Tennis Association request? Uh, which one? The, for the bulletin board. Because it has to be made in a positive. Okay. I make a motion that we approve the all weather bulletin board for the tennis association. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. All opposed, please say nay. 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 Okay, the motion that request fails. Now, can I have a motion on the Stars. request for the rules, the sign, the, mm -hmm. yeah. the rule sign? Can I, make, oh. can I make a motion that the school department purchase and install rule yep. signs uh, working with the DPW? Is there a second on that? Second. Any further discussion on that one? We're not going to get too 
gaudy out there, right? Sign yeah. up the place. Okay. One by each door. Right. Yeah. I think right now you have smaller ones yeah. on each door, mm -hmm. but they're put on with zip ties and they're starting yeah. to break. Oh. And okay. So. Cool. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Item 7.3, music trip to New York City. Okay. Um, in your packet you have a memo uh, from Dr. Flanagan to me outlining a music trip for this October for our um, choral group. Um, they've been invited to sing at uh, Rock, uh, excuse me, Empire, Empire State, State Building. Building. Cool. Um, yeah, which is, uh, is a really uh, nice invitation and um, certainly would provide further uh, notoriety for our choral group. Yeah. We've got chaperones and yeah, that's, that's well, it's well, talking about chaperones. It's really it's really it's really really students. Okay. And it also talks about um, cost and, and the uh, fact that how they would uh, yeah. pay for it. It's, it's pay for it's every fund. <coughs> yeah, and cool. then hundred dollars to the students. So nice. okay, do I have a motion? I move that we uh, approve the music department trip to New York City for the uh, their performance at the Empire State Building on October twenty eighth, twenty sixteen. Or second. second. Any further discussion on yeah, that? Yeah, she's going to have to come back to us because she doesn't talk about whether they need the rest of the trip. Or right. Not. Okay. So you can make that note. Which is, is that the only thing we're looking for? Yeah. That's everything else is. All right. Cost. So, so should we should we make that motion pending uh, information on requirements? Nurses nurses? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Depending on what? Pending the information uh, whether or not a nurse is required. So it's approved once we have the information. Yeah. Are they approved for every uh, trip, or depending on the students? So, so we yeah. depends on the students. Students. So we can vote on this <laughs> with pending approval, yeah. right? Yeah. No. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Seven point four. Music trip to Providence. Okay. This is mm -hmm. our second uh, music trip. This one would take place in February going to um, Providence, Rhode Island. And again, it's our uh, vocal music uh, group participating in an invitational, high school invitational choral festival. Um, outlines for you uh, some of the uh, standards and, uh, that are found in the Mass Fine Arts Frameworks. No, I think this, pro this one would be the same approval with yeah. the nurse, yes, so she'd yeah. have to get back to us on that. Exactly. Okay, so do we have a motion? I move that we approve the music department's trip to Providence, Rhode Island uh, for the Invitational Choral Festival on February 3rd, 2017, pending uh, information whether or not a nurse is required. Okay, the motion is there a second? Second. Any further discussion on this one? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, that passes. Um, moving along to the Rays of Hope, item 7.5. We did um, the Corey Garwacki yeah. walk, uh, and during that uh, discussion, we talked about Raise of Hope being usually at a later wow. October date. The Corey Garwacki run walk is on October 15th, and Raise of Hope is looking to use the uh, parking lot on October 30th. They don't use the, the building? <coughs> uh, I don't believe they use no. the building. They just use it for shuttle purposes. Yeah. Move that we allow the Rays of Hope to use the high school parking lot October 30th, 2016. Is there a second? Second. Is that a Sunday? Uh, oh, sad. No, I it's believe it's a Sunday. Sunday. This is a Sunday. Okay, okay so there's no, there's no events allowed during that time anyway. No. So. Right. Um, I will send out a reminder with the, the approval of this that uh, we now have two events in October 15th and the 30th where to make sure that we have no rec or high yeah, school events. Because I can tell you now, there's a lot of angry citizens that all the parking places are taken by the rec parents watching the kids play during the voting. Okay. A lot of angry, so I'm being really emphasized to Mr. Drury that, you know, yeah. need to, to what? To live by these. Oh, the day of the voting. The sign yeah. Dreams. yeah. Okay, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Last item, 7.6, Hamden County Sheriff's Department. Um, I've never heard of this. What do, they, what do they want to do? Up? This is um, basically what they're asking. In your package, you have a letter from yeah. the uh, Sheriff's Department. And 
During our um, fireworks display, the Sheriff's Department does bring personnel to help us with traffic mm -hmm. um, and uh, safety and security. Basically, to interact with the radios that our police and fire are using, what the Sheriff's Department is asking is to put a temporary repeater up in our press box in the stadium so that during that time frame, their radios will be working with our radios. Um, yeah, it's just mounted when they set with the with the zip ties. Mm -hmm. and they yeah. take it down as soon as the event is over. Great. Yeah. Right. Move that we allow the Hamden County Sheriff's Department to place portable repeater on the press box uh, at East Elmino High School uh, for July 3rd activities. Nice. Your second? Second. Any further discussion on this? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, thank you to Mr. Mackey for Due diligence tonight. If there's nothing else to come before the committee, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Adjourn for the summer, actually. Huh? Yes. So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you.